yours. Thank you. So let's get this thing on the road. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining my talk, Elvin R. Hex, Switching to Hex During Production. My name is Alexander Rotter. I'm a browser front-end developer with the Elvin R team. I have a bachelor degree in computer engineering, so I come from a more hardware and technology-centric background, but got pretty early into software development. I joined InnoGames and the Elvin R team in May 2014, so I effectively belong to the inventory by now. And I mostly deal with Hex, with some PHP, since that is our backend technology, and a little bit of JavaScript on the side um, in experiments. And for better or for worse, I'm our team's resident Star Trek nerd. What am I going, about, uh, going to talk about today? So first of all, a short introduction about our game. What is Elvenar? What is it all about? Then um, I will talk about the conversion and how this journey uh, turned out for us. Next up is some uh, topics about the challenges and problems we encountered along the way and how we solved them. And then as the fourth point, I will uh, show a bit about some uh, performance issues that we encountered in the conversion and in the uh, generated output and how we fixed those. And um, to wrap it up, some closing remarks about IDEs and editors and how we're dealing with that. So Elvenar, what is it all about? Elvenar is a 2D isometric city building game where you develop your town from a small hamlet to a bustling metropolis. It is set in a fantastical world with um, impressive buildings and uh, mythical characters. We have um, magical environments and generally magic is taking the place of technology in a lot of places. As you can see here, for example, we are providing our players with a set of events distributed across uh, or over the whole year. And some of them, they can uh, play alone, but others are intended to be played in groups, engaging our fellowships, uh, so our equivalent of guilds from other games. So you can see we have a huge variety of activity to keep our players engaged and provide them with challenging and engaging content basically every week. So some stats. Um, we have an HTML5 browser client available on our own websites and in the Microsoft Store as an app. We have a mobile app written in Unity available on Apple's, Google's, and Amazon's platforms. We are doing daily builds for our beta server and biweekly deployments for our live servers. And speaking of which, as an international product, we are available on 20 markets. We are running 49 individual game servers and we are available in 18 different languages. Our game has approximately 250,000 daily active users, and our team is composed of 40 people, give or take, with roughly half of them being developers for Hex, PHP, and Unity, respectively. So um, we consider ourselves a Hex legacy project, and you might be wondering where the hell does this legacy part come from? Um, since we are relatively new to Hex. So the problem is that our code base is actually quite old. The first commit to our repository was made in May 2013, so eight and a half years ago. And back then, our project was literally a clone of the Forge of Empires repository. But ever since, our games have diverged into completely different directions. And um, effectively today, no two systems are compatible between us. We have become, for all intents and purposes, completely different games. And we have over 4,300 unique buildings, which are effectively the main characters of our games since we are a city builder. Our code has 6,500 classes and almost 900 interfaces. And in total, we have over 300, well above 300,000 lines of code. So for all intents and purposes, Elvenar is not what you could consider a small project by any means. A lot of code, a lot of assets. Yeah. So how are we doing this? 
first of all, we don't do any kind of rocket science. Elvenar is a very UI heavy game and we don't have the time for much experimentation. So we are utilizing a lot of libraries to get our work done. And I'm, I will just mention a few of them as a sample of the several libraries that we're using. Um, robot legs and Swift suspenders for MVC and dependency injection. We're using a modified fork of OpenFL for our rendering. We're using a way 3D for our battle view, which you can see here. So our battle is composed of a 3D scene with 3D characters and 3D obstacles. We're using Starling for our city map and world map views. Here you can see an example screenshot of the world map, which is a tiling hex grid upon which the player cities are distributed. And for our animations, we're using GSAP, formerly known as Timeline Max or Tween Max, to um, control our animations and make the game look pretty when we can. In addition to that, we are also using a bunch of internally developed libraries, some of which we developed inside our own team and shared with the company, others which were developed by other projects and then incorporated into our game. For example, we have a library for our tutorial configuration, which was developed by our team and then shared with other projects, even ported to other languages. We're using a library that is currently co-developed with the Forge of Empires team to gather browser diagnostics information to help our customer support, um, to help players if they encounter any problems. And we're also including a library that was initially developed by the Forge of Empires team to expose your eye elements to our test automation. We are running a combination of CodeCept and Selenium and this library to allow fully automated control of the game client to check our features and fully automate our tutorial, for example, as additional safety nets. So that being said, Let's talk about the conversion. Why were we doing that? Well, not because we were bored or um, so amazingly interested in it, but rather because it, would, it helped us solve a problem. A problem that was coming right at us like an angry 400 pound silverback gorilla. So let's go back a few years and imagine it's 2017 and you're uh, maintaining a huge action script code base you're a live product with regular deployments and long running events over the year that cannot be easily delayed or interrupted. And then Adobe drops this bombshell into your lap that you have about three years at most before Flash Player will be taken behind the barn and shot. And this was quite a threatening situation to us because we were a Flash game. When the Flash Player goes down, it would take us with it unless we found a way to avoid that. So we very quickly started looking at our options, what we could do to solve this problem. And based on the topic of the talk, you can probably guess which option won out in the end. But for a bit of context, uh, excuse me, um, I will mention a few of the other things that we were looking at. So first off, we briefly considered rewriting the game with proper web technology. But that was very quickly canned because um, just the extensive scope of our project made that a prohibitive endeavor. We were using an already existing game as a foundation and then had at that time four years of development on top. And rewriting that in less than three years just wasn't realistically viable. In addition to that, even if we had started doing this, it would have gobbled up so much of our development uh, capacity that our normal operation, our normal events and features would have been massively delayed or interrupted. And this is a problem because we can't call the Vatican and ask for Easter to be delayed or something like that. And finally, uh, we had a lack of developer experience because we were at that time uh, pretty centered on the action script tech stack and just didn't have the experience uh, with uh, the JavaScript game engines that were out there. So rewriting all this with a fixed non-movable deadline just didn't turn out viable at all. 
Another idea that was more realistic um, was utilizing Unity. We had, like I said, we had a mobile client written in Unity and Unity provides a WebGL export. So could we maybe utilize that? The problem there was that we had never really explored that export option uh, with the consideration of getting it production ready. We did some experiments while our mobile client was shaping up, but that was just to get a rough feel how this thing works, if it worked at all, how it behaved, if it was really possible, but it wasn't done with any notion of actually releasing the result. And based on that, there was a big technical problem with the export that we managed to generate. And that was that browsers didn't really like it because it was a 130 megabyte JavaScript block. Firefox was very unhappy with it. Even Chrome choked on it. And we're, not, and we're better not talking about the Microsoft browsers. And while I'm certain that we could have probably solved that issue by restructuring the scenes or optimizing our prefabs, another much more pressing issue was that the mobile client at that time wasn't feature complete. A lot of elements of the game, like the player inventory and a lot of consumables, or Ancient Wonders, which are a specific type of uh, powerful buildings with special upgrade mechanics, was completely missing from it. So even if we got the convert this uh, WebGL export working and could make the mobile client the default client for Elvena, we would have taken away those features that had been available for months, if not years, in the browser client, in addition to forcing players to relearn the game with completely different UI. And the final nail in the coffin for that idea was in the end also lack of developer experience. While we have very competent and knowledgeable uh, mobile developers that know how to work with Unity and um, work on a production app and deploy it to app stores and stuff like that, the browser developers of course didn't know that. So we would have severely limited our available development resources and the, and the mobile developers would have had to onboard and uh, train the browser developers while implementing new features, while um, catching up on features. And that also just wasn't viable from our manpower that we had available and also given the time scope. Finally, we also looked at, hey, how does our other big flash game in the company solve this problem? And Forge was running with the hex conversion. So we considered, hey, can we maybe just adopt the same process for us? Because it had proven to work on a very similar code base. While our games are distinctly different today, you can still see the shared ancestry in a lot of places like general structure and package names and things like that. And the conversion worked for Forge. We also knew that this process and this technology of the conversion was actively being worked on because Forge wasn't done yet. They were still improving it. And finally, and that was really important and turned out to be extremely beneficial for us, it was in-house experience. We could effectively just walk down a flight of stairs, turn a corner, and talk to the guys that had been working on that for their own project. And so in the end, that is the solution that we went with. And in retrospect, that was the best possible thing we could have done in this situation. So as a recap, we take our action script code, convert it to hex code with as little changes as possible just to make it work. Then we use this converted code as some kind of intermediate language to build the HTML client and later in the process, also the flash client. If you want to know more about how exactly that process works and what the complications and the technical details about that thing are. Forge of Empires has done two talks about that that I can recommend if you want to know more. So the Hex October 2019 talk by Dan, Migration of Empires, and the Hex Up uh, February 2020 talk by Nenad, Forge of Empires Action Script to Hex Postmortem are really good and go into much more detail of this whole process and the technology behind it than I can do here today. So give them a listen if you like to know more. With that being said, I said that um, the availability of the, having this knowledge in our company was extremely valuable. And that shows in the timeline of this whole conversion in our team, because we went 
very rapidly uh, along. So in October 2017, we had the official project kickoff to include this converter technology into our, into our game. In November, the setup and the basic infrastructure was ready. And just two months later, we had the first client version that was starting and loaded into the city map. The UI was completely missing. And if you clicked on a building, an exception exploded in your face. But it was starting. So this whole thing actually works. We now just have to keep working on it and improve it and fix all the issues. Then three months later in April, we had another massive milestone. And that was that our tutorial was completely playable. This is a big thing because our tutorial doesn't fake anything. If you place a building in the tutorial, you actually place that building on your city map. If you research a technology, you really research that technology. So all the systems involved in the tutorial, like the quest system, the city map, the tech tree, the world map, all that stuff worked. And that was really nice to see after a very short amount of time. We fixed some bugs, made some improvements, and in June, we enabled an opt-in on our beta server that allowed players to choose between the Flash client and the converted HTML5 client. And in October 2018, we enabled the same opt-in on our live servers. Additionally, we started an A-B test to see whether new players like the Flash player client better or the HTML5 client. And it turned out that players like the HTML client better because it wasn't Flash. So, after that, we settled in a very stable status quo. The conversion pipeline was running. Our clients were stable. We were continuing developing our game, adding features and so on in ActionScript and delivering both clients to our players. But Forge, in the meantime, was busy making the final uh, step. And that was to get rid of this conversion and switch to a hex-only code base. So in May 2019, we started making preparations to also follow them in this path because it didn't make any sense keeping an old and no longer supported language around if there was a much better alternative. That took some time. And in January 2020, we officially kicked off the project of in introducing this new converter into our pipeline and also making that final hex switch. In April, the setup of the new converter was ready. In October, we released our first client that was converted with the new technology on our beta server. In November, we released it on the live servers. And finally, in December, we removed all ActionScript game code from our repository. After that, it was just a bit of cleanup and the last traces of the converter pipeline was removed uh, from our scripts and our Jenkins in February this year. So about a, a little bit less than three years, give or take. Um, and we were done. And that was really amazing. And we weren't sure if we could have made any better decisions there. With that being said, uh, the road to this success was not without its bumps and roadblocks. And I'm going to talk a bit about that now. So there were a couple of issues that we quickly identified that we could see coming. Um, things that we knew needed updating and changing, but there were also a couple of issues that we encountered completely unexpectedly and that really caught us by surprise. So one of the first things that we knew we had to change was namespaces. I don't know if any of you um, used that back in the day, but ActionScript allows you to define custom namespaces, which you can then use to restrict uh, accessibility and visibility to functions and properties. So you can effectively define your own type of public or your own type of private. We were using this uh, technology in our asset metadata system as well as some parts of our UI framework to limit access to specific data and functionality. And since Hex didn't support that functionality, we had to get rid of it. To do so, we had to change our code generation 
as well as the way how we access the specific metadata and these locked properties in our game code. And the most common solution that we went with was just removing it. So we didn't try to replace it with any kind of fancy at allow uh, structures or something like that. We just replaced the visibility with public or private as was appropriate in that specific context. So that was pretty easy to fix. Something that was a bit more complicated were our modules. So our Flash client was split into multiple modules, not only to encourage separation of concerns, but also to minimize the download players would need to go through. The idea behind that was um, that when you load the game, you start in your city. So you enter the game in, your, in the city module. And when you then click on a button to enter the tech tree, only then the tech tree module containing all the related logic and UI is downloaded. And only then also the associated data for the technologies is downloaded. But that didn't really work at all with the um, single HTML JavaScript thing that fell out of the converter, so we had to change it. And we updated it in a way similar to how Forge solved this problem by changing it all into a single file app uh, in the end. This, however, was not as easy as just copying all the modules code into a single source folder because we actually had some part of the game structured around this module dependency. And we had to change quite a bit of logic that was previously um, tied to uh, loading and instantiating those modules and dispatching events to hide and show the loading screens and things like that. But updating the game wasn't the only problem here because this module structure was also present in our IntelliJ project configuration. And that proved to be a little bit annoying because we could only really effectively keep working once this uh, merging had been propagated across all the branches. Otherwise, you would have to continuously had to rebuild your IntelliJ setup every time you switched between a merged branch and a not yet merged branch. So that was a bit annoying. A problem, however, that we encountered completely by surprise and that we really didn't expect was conflicting or illegal overrides. This was a problem that worked perfectly fine in ActionScript. And we didn't really expect it. So here, for example, you can see a simple wrapper class from our action script code. Again, no rocket science here. It has a constructor, a private field, and a getter. And then we have child classes that expand uh, or extend this class and specify a more narrow type. Again, no rocket science, constructor, getter, private field. The problem now is that Hex doesn't really like um, child classes overriding properties in the parent classes with different types. And that exploded in our faces. And the issue behind that, that we then uh, found out the hard way, is that private in Hex is equivalent to protected in ActionScript. So you can always override it in a child class. But the idea of private as it is defined in action script so that it is really confined to this single particular class doesn't exist in hex and we didn't uh, know that back then or we didn't assume it would be a problem so to fix that we actually had to ask the forge team for help to update the converter with additional logic to check for those places and rename those fields and the only way to be absolutely sure that in such an automated context, there are no naming conflicts is to include the full qualified class name, which gave us wonderful constructs like these here. And this solved the problem, even though it is a bit ugly to look at. And this is the kind of technical depth that we're still cleaning up today. I mean, in the end, we don't really care exactly that much about how the private fields are called in our wrapper classes. But of course, we still clean it up because nobody likes to look at stuff like this. Another problem that was catching us uh, quite unexpectedly 
was null iterators. This was another thing that worked perfectly fine in ActionScript, but proved to be problematic uh, in the converted output. So again, you take an ActionScript class that looks pretty harmless um, from the outset, and you just have this for each loop down here that iterates over a collection uh, contained in the VO. So no rocket science here. Also, the converted class looks pretty neat and clean and no apparent issue here. The problem, however, comes up when this provinces collection here, for example, is null. And that could happen depending on player progress, player behavior. So that wasn't guaranteed. And that provided us with really weird bug reports about some windows not showing any content and in other cases, the client freezing up. And we weren't really sure what the hell was going on there. And it turns out that in ActionScript, if a collection is null and you try to iterate over it, the loop is simply skipped because there's nothing to iterate over. But in the generated HTML and JavaScript output, um, the same location failed with an exception because the code tried to read the length property of an iterator. And that was a big problem because it was a runtime issue and not a compile time issue. So to fix that, we added a sentry logging to all the generated loops to identify the individual spots in our code where this issue occurred. And we deployed the version with that logging to beta just to gather those reports and then fix the, uh, the reports as quickly as possible. You might wonder why didn't we just add explicit uh, not equal null checks just in the converter and be done with it. The problem there was that there were a few issues with that. Um, for one, as, uh, some places in our action script code were actually including those uh, guard checks to begin with. And these checks were of course converted. So if we added an additional null check for every loop, we would have two nested null checks, which is a bit silly. But additionally, we knew that we didn't need this null check in all possible instances. We have a lot of places in our game uh, code where we know that the collection cannot possibly be null. It is just that a few edge cases that depend on player progress and player behavior were causing these issues, these very visible issues. And that's why we went with the um, logging and manually fixing approach. So all those technical problems that actually broke the client or the conversion pipeline or the compiler were fixed, we quickly encountered that there was another problem that we had to solve. And that was um, a distinct set of performance issues that we discovered. And I'm going to talk about our particular need for speed uh, now. So one of the problems that we found was our ACID metadata system. I mentioned this thing pre uh, previously, and now I'm going into a bit of detail what the hell this is actually about and why it was a problem. So this ACID metadata is the core logic for how the whole client handles UI assets. And it has over 1300 unique usages. So replacing it is something that we would really like to avoid at any possible cost, simply because 1300 usages that would need to be fixed. The idea behind that is that we run code generation on our Jenkins that generates um, classes representing the available assets in our asset SVN. And then we use those generated classes at compile time to guarantee the availability of that asset at runtime. How does this look like? Actually pretty simple because these generated classes form a object graph a hierarchy that can be accessed via dot pathing here. And the last leaf in this whole object graph then represents the actual asset. So in this particular example, if someone removed the timer background asset, from our asset SVN and committed that change. The resource generator would be triggered, run the code generation, 
which would recreate the metadata, commit that to master. And then when the client on master is built the next time, this line would fail at compile time because the getter and the class that represent this asset are no longer available in the metadata structure. And how do these classes look like? Again, no rocket science. They're pretty simple. They extend a base class based on their type. Then they have an init method with a bunch of private fields and then some getters that didn't fit on the slide anymore. So what's the problem here? The problem is not the quality of those classes, but the sheer quantity, because we had over 7,000 of them. Remember in the introduction when I said that we had about 6,500 classes in code? The asset metadata more than doubled that. And that became a problem because that introduced significant slowdowns, not only into the conversion pipeline, but also into the JavaScript output, because those are 7,000 classes that the browsers needed to pass when you load the client. And to fix that, we used a very unique hex feature that probably isn't available in that particular form in any language I am in any other language I'm familiar with. So this was a unique solution to hex and it worked out pretty nicely. So what we did, we replaced our code generation in a way that it no longer emitted the classes, but rather a type dev structure that mimicked the class hierarchy. So as you can see in this example, we have a lot of type devs and uh, getters that reference other type devs. And this uh, allowed us to keep this dot path in the code. Like I said, those dot paths had 1300 usages. So keeping this in place was a really huge benefit for us. The actual data was then offloaded into a JSON file whose nesting mimicked also that same structure and hierarchy. So we could use the type devs at compile time and then replace it at runtime with the JSON data. And that proved to be a massive improvement because it not only lowered the JavaScript output size from over 34 megabytes down to 20 megabytes. It also condensed all the asset information into a JSON that was about 1.3 megabytes, which was really nice. And it reduced compilation time by 50%, which is expected since we got rid of about half the classes that needed to be compiled. The other uh, performance issue was also related to assets, but not our UI assets, but our actual building assets. Our building assets come in two files or components or what you want to call them. So first of all, there's an XML file with render information, like the number of sprites, their rotation and position, the location in the sprite sheet, and so on. And then a binary ATF with the actual image data. And the names for those files are standardized by our asset pipeline. They start with ISO underscore, and then you have this uh, character and number soup um, that is based on a hash of the respective file. But these files then are no longer telling in any way, how do you know which file you need to load if you want to display a specific building? So you need some kind of lookup. And this lookup was also a problem. We had another code generate, uh, auto generated class that had three dictionaries or maps that performed this actual mapping from the telling name to the generated file names. This down here is not a typo. So this constructor actually had 62 something thousand instructions. And let's, ju let's just say that hex compiler wasn't too impressed with that because it intru introduced quite a slowdown. We had compilation times of over three minutes, which was um, very annoying actually. And most of the time was spent in the analysis step. We are incredibly thankful that the hex foundation managed to fix that problem in 4.2.3. And after we updated to this version, 
the compilation times went down to about one quarter of what they had been before. So that was really valuable for us. But there's a bonus round for the ISO assets file because we very recently ran into another problem. We added a set of new buildings that added 450 more instructions to the constructor. And then we hit a garbage collection limit in Google Closure, which we couldn't resolve. That was a hard limit. So that file, that monstrosity was actually reaching the breaking point. And after some experimentation and trying to work around this problem, we just removed it completely and replaced it with a pre-sorted JSON file that we then embedded into the client with a macro. So this horrible 62,000 line constructor is completely gone as a side effect of this. And that's pretty much it about uh, technical and performance issues. As a few cl closing remarks, um, some words about IDEs and editors and what we are using in the Elvenar team. So back when we were using ActionScript 3, the world was a bit simpler because we were just using IntelliJ IDEA. It had everything we needed. It was really nice. So we were just using that in the team. Since our switch to Hex, we introduced, in addition to IntelliJ, also Visual Studio Code, which is a really nice editor to work with. But it turned out that both of these options come with their own challenges. So first of all, chat brains with some uh, version apparently changed the plugin API, which caused the hex plugin to stop working with more recent IntelliJ versions. And we, it is still working with the old version and we're still using it with the old version. So that's also like an inconvenience. It's not a showstopper. Visual Studio Code, however, comes with its own set of problems, mostly that refactoring options are limited by the editor, which is also annoying for a developer if you want to do something simple like renaming an interface method. And last but not least, another specific challenge that we face is that due to our massive code base, Visual Studio Code is sometimes a bit slow to respond for things like um, autocomplete or intelligence or find references. So how do, we, how do we work around that? How do we deal with that? Well, first of all, patience is a virtue. As much as I would like uh, shouting at a computer, making it work faster, that's sadly not how things work. So sometimes you just need to chill out and, and deal with it. Um, additionally, what I personally found out that full text search in Visual Studio Code is surprisingly fast and can actually, at least for me, serve as a suitable stand-in for find references. If you know the name of the thing you're looking for, full text search works, in my opinion, quite well. And then last but not least, remember only a bad craftsman blames his tool. So you use whatever IDE is more appropriate for your current task. If you have to do some refactoring, you use IntelliJ because that has the nice refactoring support. If you're just doing normal, normal air quotes development work, you can easily use Visual Studio Code for it. And that's about it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, let's keep them coming. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, there was one question from the other Alex, but I believe that you've already answered it. I'm just going to read it out uh, again, just in case. Uh, it says, with such a huge code base, do you use anything to split monolithic JS file produced by hacks into smaller modules? Um, if, if that refers to the um, replacement that we did for the ISO assets? No. In some places, we load data um, in chunks. For example, the configuration data for our buildings is loaded as several different JSONs that are then aggregated, but we don't have an automated system for that. Okay. 
And then the next one here is what server do you use for your backend? Is it Node.js or something else? Um, our game backend is running on PHP and Nginx. All right. And what do you miss in Hex? Oh boy, that's a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is I love you. <laughs> um, so off the top of my head, um, I think the only thing that I'm kind of missing is some of those convenience operators that other languages are getting, like the null core lessons operator or this question mark dot safe access traversal operator thing. Um, because that can save a lot of boilerplate, especially if you have nested structures and you need to check null on every single step. That can get quite a bit uh, annoying. But that's about the only thing. So I wouldn't say that anything critical is missing. I can't think of anything right now. You will love my talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Right. Now you've got uh, my attention. <laughs> And Alex uh, is reiterating on the question before, he was just saying it was about how you split 20 megabytes of JavaScript into smaller files. Ah, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, 20 megabytes of JavaScript. That was um, the uh, 34 megabyte to 20 megabyte uh, deduction that we saw in size was because we didn't have the 7,000 classes compiled into the uh, uh, JavaScript client anymore. That was split out into a separate JSON file. And that compresses much better because there's a lot of duplicate data in the structure, uh, like the strategy names for compression and things like that. So that was just um, more compressible in the end than the compiled and generated uh, classes. And that was what uh, allowed this uh, deduction in size. All right. And actually, I have a question completely unrelated to the talk. But um, so you learned hacks during this process, for this process, or were you aware of it before? Um, I was aware of hacks before. I have done some very basic rudimentary experimentation with it at a previous employer, but that mm. didn't really go anywhere. Um, but with this conversion of Elvenar from ActionScript to Hex, that was the first time I actually had to uh, develop in it. And I think like most of our team, it was a bit learn as we go, because mm. most of us were ActionScript developers on the browser yeah. team, uh, maybe with a bit of TypeScript or JavaScript uh, experience on the side. But since hex is uh, from the syntax and the general language structure quite similar to ECMAScript, this um, migration was actually pretty easy for most of us, I would say. So your learning experience was kind of comparatively pleasant then? Yeah. All right. And are you doing anything in-house like for learning, like inter-team wise? Or is it just everyone sort of tries to figure it out by themselves. Do you have like hex classes or something? Um, not that I'm aware of. And it, it is a bit sad actually, because Forge of Empires is actually doing all the really cool stuff <laughs> with, with hex and Tink and uh, all that shenanigans. And we in Elven are, are like lagging behind a bit. Okay. So, so we don't really have the, um, the experience with that mm -hmm. and also the opportunities are missing so because you're waiting we have a very pioneer. busy roadmap. Yeah, so it's like you're too busy to pioneer, basically. Like you're waiting yeah. for the day off when you can go <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> All right. I can, I can like... jump, in, jump in here a bit. Um, I mean, we do not have like uh, dedicated hex classes, but what we have usually from time to time, we organize knowledge sharing um, uh, talks, you know, like Dan, for instance, gave a couple of them in, in, uh, in internally in Inno Games, where oh, we would okay. invite uh, like different projects that are using hacks to attend those presentations. Mm -hmm. 
Another thing that we have as an opportunity to share knowledge is also we have internal dev talks. This is a conference that is actually happening tomorrow uh, in Inno oh, Games where people are so submitting cool. talks uh, like from the whole company on different topics and then we also sometimes have the the hacks talks there. there. And we have hack sync like in the like a dedicated meeting uh, to bi-weekly meeting where we share like experience and knowledge in in for hacks. So you have an things. internal hacks meeting that's called hacks sync. Exactly. Yes. I have started a naming convention. My work <laughs> here is done. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. Do you have some of your internal talks? available to watch online for others is a question. Now everyone is very interested. Um, not really. As not, not really, not I'm really. afraid. Yeah. All right. But the this is a good point. We can maybe think about opening those. Maybe things. I think yeah, it's a missed opportunity. I mean, if you're doing them anyway, of course, I mean, I understand there may be some sort of like privacy or, you know, confidentiality issues. There. Privacy is actually a big problem because we're recording those talks, of course, for uh, internal usage and for mm -hmm. colleagues who might not be able to attend. And then, of course, you would have the faces and names of the attendees of that talk visible in the recording. Mm -hmm. So you and need that like, would, permission. And that basically. would require a lot yeah, of overhead um, to make that GDPR compliant to mm -hmm. actually um, allow that sharing and yeah. therefore, we decided that for now, those talks are in-house only. Maybe that will change in the future. Maybe we will find a way to solve that on a technical level. Or you could just mine them for future hex and talks and just kind of go through them and be like, <laughs> I mean, well, you don't, nothing says that you have to come up with a completely new one every time if the audience is different. True enough. Right? So you can kind of just go. All right. Okay, so we're headed into a bit of a break here and we'll see you in, we're five minutes ahead of schedule. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. That's five past the hour. All right, see you then. See you in a bit. See you.